in order to prevent atrial fibrillation. These are my disclosure. And uh, of course, you know that uh, this uh, uh, very common arrhythmias, uh, and it has been uh, estimated that uh, numbers of adults with atrial fibrillation in the European Union will more than double. So this has really major public health implications. Let me summarize now what has been already uh, indicated in the relation between high blood pressure and atrial fibrillation. First, it is well known that hypertension represents an important risk factor for new onset atrial fibrillation and because of the high prevalence, hypertension is responsible for more uh, atrial fibrillation cases in the population than any other risk factors. And it has been already shown that uh, uh, considering studies, clean, uh, randomized clinical trials, uh, as well as uh, uh, observational studies, registries, and so on, up to 2017 this year, the prevalence of hypertension in all these studies is among 50 to 90 percent. Uh, quite recently, in the Framingham Heart Study, the so-called trajectories of risk factors, uh, looking at main risk factors for atrial fibrillation had been considered during a quite long follow-up. And uh, you can see that uh, the uh, risk of new onset atrial fibrillation is uh, clearly increased in hypertensive patients, uh, mainly in those uh, in whom uh, blood pressure uh, was initially increased, but also in those in whom it was initially decreased. In fact, both groups remained at higher risk of atrial fibrillation in comparison, for instance, to prehypertensive with increasing blood pressure. And this means, uh, in my mind, that uh, once that hypertension has been established, and probably once that uh, organ damage in the heart has been established, it is uh, quite difficult to reverse the risk or fully regress the risk despite uh, reduction in blood pressure. The same point has been looked at in real life, looking at uh, um, electronic health records in uh, uh, administrative databases. And um, you can see in this um, uh, uh, large cohort of uh, uh, more than 4 million adults uh, with an age between 30 to 90 years in the United Kingdom, that uh, after the follow-up of seven years, in fact, for any increase in systolic blood pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury, the risk of atrial fibrillation was increased, but it was more in the younger subjects, more in females, more with a normal body mass index. So this means that in this population in whom probably increased uh, systolic blood pressure was the main risk factor, then the role in inducing heart fibrillation was quite clear. Uh, in addition, uh, an increase in blood pressure is uh, responsible for the progression from uh, um, uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation to persistent atrial fibrillation. So it is clear the role of hypertension in inducing atrial fibrillation that uh, most probably is uh, mediated by the onset of uh, cardiovascular damage, even in an early phase, in a preclinical phase. The development of left ventricular hypertrophy is, of course, associated to an increased incidence of new onset atrial fibrillation, about three times more risk of having atrial fibrillation after long follow-up from eight to 10 years in our population. And also, vascular damage in the large arteries as evaluated by pulse wave velocity, 
or uh, augmentation index and central pulse pressure is associated to an increased incidence uh, of atrial fibrillation, new onset atrial fibrillation. Uh, at least uh, you can see in the fourth quartile of the distribution, this large population in the Framingham Heart Study, this relation is quite clear, as it was clear when we, they considered the um, uh, functional alteration of the large arteries as evaluated by flow-mediated dilatation and hyperemic flow, there was an inverse relation. Those with uh, uh, less flow-mediated dilatation were those with uh, a more frequent uh, nuanced atrial fibrillation. And pulse pressure has been already reminded that as uh, uh, an important uh, uh, determinant of new onset atrial fibrillation, it is also an important determinant of left atrial enlargement that, as we have heard, has an important role in predicting new onset atrial fibrillation. So let's look at treatment uh, of uh, hypertension uh, in order to prevent new onset atrial fibrillation. Well, in the LIFE study, it was shown that uh, those patients with lower on treatment systolic blood pressure had uh, less new onset uh, atrial fibrillation. The conclusion was that achieved systolic blood pressure below 130 millimeters of mercury is associated with a lower risk of new onset atrial fibrillation in hypertensive patients with uh, left ventricular hypertrophy uh, uh, as evaluated by electrocardiogram. But they concluded in this rather recent study that further evaluation is needed to determine whether targeting hypertensive patients without atrial fibrillation, without atrial fibrillation, to lower systolic blood pressure goals can reduce the burden of new atrial fibrillation in this high-risk population. So there is a suggestion, but this is not a, a clear, definite demonstration. Uh, in the ACCORD study, you might remember, it was a study in patients with hypertension and diabetes in uh, uh, whom the um, uh, outcome uh, in uh, uh, two groups uh, uh, given either standard or intensive treatment was evaluated. And uh, as far as uh, arterial fibrillation was concerned, they compared uh, standard blood pressure lowering versus intensive blood pressure lowering in reducing incidence of atrial fibrillation or some indices related to the P wave, electrocardiographic markers of left atrial abnormality that are considered intermediate phenotypes of atrial fibrillation in these patients with diabetes. And the primary outcome was a composite of incidence atrial fibrillation and this index PWI. And the adjusted hazard ratios of intensive therapy group for the primary outcome and for incident PWI alone were statistically significant. There was a, a reduction. However, the intensive therapy did not affect very much the incidence of atrial fibrillation alone. This did not reach statistical significance. So the uh, suggestion was not definite, again, was not clear where there is a real advantage of reducing more blood pressure, at least in this population of patients. Yes, intensive blood pressure lowering may reduce the incidence of this composite outcome, but it failed to demonstrate a significant reduction for atrial fibrillation alone, per se. So the target blood pressure in uh, population hypertensive patient, hypertensive patient with diabetes, uh, still remains uh, to be determined uh, in my mind. However, it is clear that uh, if by treatment we may reduce organ damage, cardiac damage, there may be an advantage in preventing atrial fibrillation. Uh, this slide was presented before, it's a slide taken from uh, uh, the LIFE study, and is related to changes in left ventricular hypertrophy as evaluated by the electrocardiogram. But similar data were obtained in the same study in the subpopulation that were submitted to uh, echocardiographic evaluation of left ventricular mass. Reducing left ventricular mass index is associated to a significant reduction of new onset atrial fibrillation. And again, the dimension 
the diameter of the left atrium may be important in predicting new onset atrial fibrillation. And when a left atrium diameter was reduced by treatment, there was a reduction of risk of atrial fibrillation, vice versa, and increased of left atrium diameter may increase the ratio of new onset atrial fibrillation by at least five times. Now the point is which antihypertensive drugs we have to use. We have heard very much the role of uh, the renin angiotensin system, the role of the adrenergic nerve system, and certainly in both experimental and in several uh, 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 clinical studies, uh, the role of these uh, neurohumoral uh, uh, systems uh, have been uh, well assessed and demonstrated that in some cases may have uh, uh, an important role in inducing new onset atrial fibrillation. What can we say? We are looking at more recent uh, uh, meta-analysis that uh, have given, uh, in my opinion, uh, some uh, conflicting results. Uh, for instance, uh, in this uh, meta-analysis uh, published uh, last year uh, um, in, uh, uh, that took into consideration 28 reports from 26 randomized controlled trials, more than 165,000 patients. So you can see what uh, was the effect of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system blockade on new onset this is uh, the topic of my presentation, but also on recurrent atrial fibrillation and hypertension. Well, new onset was uh, slightly reduced. The, 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 it was a uh, borderline significance, and uh, this was due uh, to the fact that uh, the results from life study was quite clear, value study was uh, uh, enough clear, not the whole head. These are the only three studies in hypertension. So most of the advantage was demonstrated by results of life study. All the other studies, recurrence of atrial fibrillation, um, are uh, uh, determined by the results of many duplicates of studies. Yes, the uh, aldosterone blockade may have an effect, but this is a study performed in patients with left ventricular dysfunction, not uh, in patients uh, with uh, hypertension. However, it is clear that uh, in this population, uh, um, aldosterone receptor blockade by eplerenon may be quite effective. Um, in the progression, to persistent atrial fibrillation. Again, uh, the um, blockade of the renin angiotensin system may be effective. In general, uh, it was significant, uh, mainly related to the results of value. Um, the risk of atrial fibrillation according to antihypertensive treatment was also examined in a uh, uh, large uh, uh, Scandinavian population, a Danish population, during a follow-up of 15 years. And uh, in this uh, um, large database, the association between antihypertensive treatment with different classes of antihypertensive drugs and risk of water fibrillation was examined. Um, all these subjects were free of atrial fibrillation at baseline. You can see here at, that as far as atrial fibrillation, considering ACE inhibitors, there was an advantage uh, in comparison with beta blocker, diuretic, not very much with calcium antagonists. Many of them were non dehydropyridine calcium antagonist. The angiotensin receptor blocker, again, had an advantage versus beta blockers, versus diuretics, not versus calcium antagonists. If we consider stroke, the different classes of antihypertensive drugs had the same effect. There was no difference. So the conclusion was that the use of ACE inhibitor angiotensin receptor blockers compared with beta blockers and diuretics were associated with a reduced risk of atrial fibrillation, but not stroke. 
with the limitation of a retrospective study reporting association. So uh, the um, final conclusion was that uh, they suggest that controlling activation of the renin angiotensin system in addition to controlling blood pressure is associated with a reduced risk of atrial fibrillation. If you look at uh, another meta-analysis, a rather recent meta-analysis, you can see here the effect of classes of antihypertensive medication against placebo for prevention of, of atrial fibrillation. But you can see that most of the study here were study performed in patients with heart failure or at high cardiovascular risk. In any case, a few differences were observed apart from the study with beta blockers in patients with uh, heart failure. In the comparison of different drugs with all the other antihypertensive drugs, the angiotensin receptor blockers were those that performed better but again due to the effect on life and value. No difference with the other drugs. And uh, looking in a different way of the effect of uh, uh, these drugs um, in patients with uh, uh, complication of hypertension, such as heart failure or coronary heart disease, or at high risk, you can see that a real advantage of using uh, uh, the drugs was in patients with previous heart failure and in patients with high event rate. Both reduction of blood pressure and use of renin angiotensin system inhibitors were uh, uh, more effective in this subgroup of subjects. So, in conclusion, the results can be summarized with the indication of guidelines, uh, the European Society of Cardiology guidelines, as you know, indicated that as inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers and beta blockers should be considered for prevention of new onset uh, atrial fibrillation in patients with heart failure and reduce ejection fraction. No doubt about this. As inhibitor angiotensin receptor blockers should be considered for prevention of new onset atrial fibrillation in hypertension particularly with left ventricular hypertrophy, and pretreatment with ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blockers may be considered in patients with recurrent atrial fibrillation undergoing electrical cardioversion and receiving antiarrhythmic drug therapy. The drugs are not recommended for secondary prevention of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in patients with little or no underlying heart disease. Uh, the same, uh, in general, has been suggested by the previous uh, uh, hypertension guidelines uh, of the uh, European Society of Hypertension, European Society of Cardiology. It has been suggested that the beneficial effect mainly of angiotensin receptor blockers may be limited to the prevention of incident atrial fibrillation in hypertensive patients with structural heart disease, such as left ventricular hypertrophy or dysfunction or high risk in general, but no history of atrial fibrillation. Let me remind that a good uh, blood pressure control is essential in order to prevent complications in patients on anticoagulants, but this probably will be discussed more by Professor Manolis. But let me remind that in this large study, the Aristotle study that used apixaban, the conclusion was that high blood pressure measurement at any point during the trial was independently associated with a substantially higher risk of stroke or systemic embolism. So these results strongly support efforts to treat elevated blood pressure in these patients. Let me conclude with uh, some few preliminary data of a, a survey uh, that is part of a, a research project of our society on the management of patients with high blood pressure and atrial fibrillation. We have asked to give uh, the experience to several excellent centers of our society on the management of patients with uh, atrial fibrillation and hypertension. They, in this first analysis, uh, more than 700 patients were included, and you can see that many of these patients had uh, comorbidities with a very high chart vask score, 3.7, that is quite high. In this population, blood pressure was fairly well controlled, below 140 over 19, 60% uh, of patients using several drugs, mainly combination therapy. So 
the summary of the study is that uh, uh, these results may give a description of clinical characteristics of patients with hypertension and atrial fibrillation in excellent centers of our society. Um, the presence of comorbidities at the high mean chats vas score underline the high cardiovascular risk of these patients, adequate blood pressure control in less than two thirds of patients, and this blood pressure control requires large use of combination therapy. And this is the uh, whole conclusion. Hypertension and atrial fibrillation often coexist. They increase the risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Antihypertensive drugs reduce the risk of, for atrial fibrillation mainly by lowering blood pressure, but target blood pressure is not yet established. Renin angiotensin uh, aldosterone system blockers may offer additional advantages in the prevention of atrial fibrillation, but in high risk patients, those with heart failure, left ventricular dysfunction, left ventricular hypertrophy. But pressure control is needed for prevention of hemorrhagic events and also thrombotic complication during treatment of oral anticoagulants. But certainly, we need more information. Uh, on blood pressure treatment, target blood pressure, as well as uh, when to use some specific antihypertensive uh, drugs in patients with hypertension and atrial fibrillation. Thank you for your attention.